Hello, everyone, and I'm nervous and excited about the, today's, I hate to call it a webinar, that word is such a turnoff. Let's call it a masterclass. Uh, and then masterclass is on new traditions to create stability in new circumstances. Okay. We've seen that twice. Let's start over. Let's start with my promise to you. My promise to you is that we will learn about what resilience is and how to incorporate resilience in our new daily lives, that we will begin to reprioritize, though you may not need to, you may want to at the end of this masterclass, and that we're gonna get clarity on how to regularize our children's and our daily lives so that they work. And last of all, we're gonna strategize ways to spice up our weeks as we build new traditions into our daily experience. And I'm gonna ask you right now, if you have a pen and paper nearby, grab that pen and paper, or if you do that digitally, do it digitally, because this is gonna be an active masterclass. I'm not just gonna speak. You guys are gonna do some, some soul searching and some writing, and maybe even a little sharing if you feel up to it. Not a whole lot, though, don't worry, it's not a test. When our time is complete, you will have next steps and a gift, if not gifts, to get you started on your journey. Now again, make sure you have a pen and paper or the digital equivalent. And I'm gonna ask you, first of all, right now, in our new normal, what have your priorities become? And I don't mean get up and brush my teeth. I don't mean the day-to-day -day stuff. I mean big picture priorities. If we're talking about things like work and family and home and uh, what else could go out there, uh, making a difference in the world or self-development, personal development. I mean, anything like that. What are th your top three priorities? And I want you to just take a second to write down those top three priorities. And I kind of wish I had some, some game show music right now. Maybe I could be the game show music. Do, 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 do. But that might drive you off the call. So write down your top three priorities and just keep those in your hip pocket as we go through this. Who am I? I'm Rich Heller, and thank you for the smashing introduction. My credentials you already know, but I'll flip them out there anyway. I've got a master's in social work, and I've been trained as a coach and a mediator and a parent coordinator. And more importantly, the work that I've done is with couples in conflict, divorcing families. I've helped parents to build resilience in high conflict situations. I've worked with families of people recovering from addictions, which often, guess what, creates a lot of conflict. I've worked with at-risk youth, which is, which is a passion of mine, and I've worked in organizational conflict. But more important than all that chowder or the work that I've done is my sense of personal mission, my sense of unique purpose as a human being. And I believe that every human being is uniquely made and has a unique purpose and mission. We're all kind of like snowflakes from a distance. We may all look the same, but when you get up close, close we're all have unique shapes and, and shapes and um, patterns that when you apply them to the world, have a, a special difference that they make. And for me, I grew up in what I jokingly call Armageddon as a child. And because of the people in my life and the organizations that I was involved with and the traditions that my family had and that other people's families had, I came out of Armageddon, a whole and complete human being who was able to get an education and have partnerships in life and build a family. And I've got these kids who were launched successfully into the world. And I owe all that to having that support. And these are all, by the way, aspects of what builds resilience. And so my passion is for helping other people who are in that situation, who are in high conflict situations, particularly with children, to build resilience so that their children can pass through that period of possible trauma into a life filled with success as I have, but maybe with a much shorter period of of learning because I feel like I learned it all kind of the hard way and now I've boiled it down to recipes and formulas that can really help these children move through these situations much more quickly and and that's what I'm all about.
So let's talk about resilience. The first promise is we're gonna understand resilience. And as you can see, it's about awareness and habits, and it's built on a four-legged chair. And I kind of love this four-legged chair because it's, it's got a traditional look, but it, you've never seen a chair like that before. And the first leg of the chair is self-awareness and self-acceptance. And that sounds like a simple thing, like, yeah, I know who I am, or I'm getting to know who I am. But when you think about the fact that 80 or 90% of who we are is unconscious, we're like, we're like icebergs. You know, the 10% that's above the water is the part that's talking to you right now. And the other 80 or 90% is all the lessons I've learned and all the things that my culture has taught me and all the things that my family has taught me. And all of that's underwater. It, nobody can really see it, not even me. So part of self-awareness is getting to know that iceberg and getting to know why is it that when somebody pushes that button, I jump left? Or why is it when somebody pushes that button, I jump right? It's also about our skills, talents, and innate abilities. So each person has unique skill sets and unique innate abilities. And those skill sets, you could even say they're genetically predisposed to certain ways of thinking, certain ways of doing things. Some people can play piano. Some people can barely play, they can barely touch the piano. Some people can build houses. Some people don't know how to use a screwdriver. It's just something about how we're wired and it has to, it's generational. It has to do with what our great, great, great grandparents did and how it came down through us. It's just, and each one of those talents and innate abilities is something that we can grow and use in the world to prosper others and prosper ourselves. So kind of the story I was telling you about myself is that I came out of a really tough situation, but I have a unique set of skills and abilities that come out of my self-awareness and understanding of my life situation that leads me to be able to help others. And that's what drives my sense of my place in the world or my mission or my purpose is all those things come together. And I believe that everybody has this in them. Everybody has the cultural influences, the, the family traditions or lack thereof. Um, everybody has their unique skills and talents. Everybody has their buttons that their family installed and everybody can have a sense of place, mission and purpose. And when we are work at work, when we are in work that fulfills more of those talents and abilities and that sense of mission and purpose, we're happier. And when we're at jobs that have us use talents that aren't our greatest strengths or that are out of sync with other parts of who we are, we're miserable. And the last piece is practices, traditions, and structure, structures. And so on an individual level, what that looks like is if I wanna know myself better, let's go back to the, the first leg. If I wanna know myself better, there are practices that I can do. I can journal. I can see a therapist. I can get into self-hypnosis. I can, if I want to manage those triggers I was talking about, the ones that make me jump left or jump right, I can engage in mindfulness practices or meditation or prayer. Brain studies show that all three of those things basically move us from our amygdala, which is the part of our brain that's survival-oriented and very reactive and not thinking. All those three practices move us to another part of our brain. I believe it's the cerebral cortex, which which is more thinking, and we can disconnect our triggers through practices like that. Or if I want to develop my body, I can exercise. I mean, you get it, right? So on an individual level, there are practices, there are habits that help me grow as an individual. Now, when we're talking about families, or we're talking about societies, what we're talking about here are traditions. And often when we talk about tradition, I always think of Fiddler on the Roof, tradition, tradition. You know, it has kind of a very deep, goes back centuries, you know, and there's an ominous to it. And, so, and often I think of tradition sometimes as being stifling, uh, which they can be. But if we think about tradition as a technology, if we think about tradition as a way to instill values in our children or instill principles in our children, if we think about tradition as a tool that we can use in our families and at large, it becomes something more vibrant, more playful, something, a tool that we can get familiar with. And that's what this masterclass is about. 
as much as I like to talk about trigger management, as, like as, I, as much as I like to talk about conflict management, we're going to talk about how can we use this tool of tradition. And in this moment, this is an, a, a really incredible opportunity because if you think about the way we've been living our lives, a lot of our traditions, I'm putting quotation marks, have been imposed on us by the way we live our lives, right? It's sort of traditional that I got in my car and went to work. It's sort of traditional that I uh, got on the train and went to the gym. It's traditional that my kids went to school and so I had those hours free. A lot of our traditions today are, come from external sources as they did in earlier cultures. But we don't really think about the impact of those traditions. We don't really think about how they influence the values and the principles in our lives and how they impact our purpose as a family or our purpose as parents or our sense of personal place in the world. And we have this unique opportunity right now to think about that because we're all locked up. We have, suddenly, we have to figure out how to have our own traditions. We need to figure out if we're employed, we need to figure out how to work for 40 hours. And if we're employed with somebody else, how they can work for 40 hours. And if we're employed with somebody else and have children, how do we do both of our 40s and give our kids the 112 waking hours that we have left? Because that's pretty much what they need depending on their, on their size. Or if we're unemployed, we're just freaking out over about what are we gonna do about that? There doesn't seem to be a lot of employment opportunity. All right, so now we're gonna do the writing part. I hope you have your pen and paper ready. I want you to rate how you're doing in 10 areas, nine areas kind of, and on a scale of one to 10. And one is like, oh my God, this is horrible. And 10 is like, this is so amazing. I've never, my life is so amazing on a scale of one to 10. So just write down personal development and quickly pick a number between one and 10 that represents how you feel about yourself and your own personal development. Next, family and parenting, same thing. Scale of one to 10. One being I'm absent <laughs> and a 10 being they have my full attention all the time. I'm the most amazing parent in the world. Maybe they don't have your full attention all the time. Maybe they don't need it, but you're still the most amazing parent in the world. Fun and enjoyment. How much fun and enjoyment in general, or if you want to just do it for this period of time, because we've all been in lockdown for four to six weeks, depending on where you are. One to 10. Spiritual awareness or spiritual practices or your spiritual life in general, whatever that means to you. If you have a religion in your life, fine. If you don't, fine. It's whatever spiritual, I think of spirituality as our connection to others. Uh, and how do we exercise that connection to everything else? Now, these kind of go together because they're both in the relationship sphere. On a one to 10, how are your intimate relationships? And that doesn't necessarily mean physically intimate, though it can. It might just mean that you're, how safe, emotionally safe do you feel in your relationships? Like intimacy is about, I feel safe enough and vulnerable enough to show myself. So I'm not embarrassed. And the other is social relationships. How do you feel about your social relationships? One to 10. Next is health and aging. This is always a good one. You know, some days I feel awesome and then I look in the mirror. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> That's kind of a joke and kind of not. How do you feel about your health and aging? One to 10. Personal finance. This could be a good one for a lot of people. Right now, scale of one to 10, how do you feel about your personal finance? Career and profession. So again, don't, when you think about career, think about your sense of being challenged and your level of engagement. So if you're in a job where you're not feeling challenged and engaged, you might not have such a high rating. If you really love your work, you're probably going to have a higher rating. Oh, fun and enjoyment twice. Well, we don't need to do that twice, but it is up there twice. Okay. Now, you don't need to compare this to your priorities. These are the priorities that my clients give to me typically over the last four to six weeks that they've been sharing with me. Almost universally, their priorities have been number one, work. Like they're trying to figure out how am I going to get my work done here at home? There's so many distractions. I've, and I've got the most of them have kids. Actually, all of them have kids. Let's be transparent. I work with families for the most part. 
Uh, and to be clear, when I talk about families, it's not necessarily two people cohabitating together. Very often I'm working with families where there are parents who are living in separate domiciles and their marriage has been dissolved, but they are still a family. They are still having a partnership of some kind because they have children together. So typically they say work first, kids second, and actually this third one, they very often don't even mention their partner. It's usually work first, kids second, and me third. Like they're usually not even thinking about their partner if they're living with someone else. And why is that? I'm gonna let you meditate on that. Typically, as we go through this, what they discover, I don't tell them this, is this thing that we all know, that if we don't put the oxygen mask on ourselves first, we can't take care of our children, right? If you're on the plane, you know how it works. If you put the oxygen mask on them and suddenly you pass out, how are they gonna get off the plane? So the, the rule of if your children are number one on your list, they can't really be because if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't really show up for them, right? And so what's an example of that? An example of that is you're sleeping four hours a night. And then when you're with your children, you're short-tempered, of course, because who isn't short uh, unless you're Bill Clinton, who apparently thrived on four hours a night. I tried that. I just put on weight. I couldn't do it, and I got very irritable. If you're not getting enough rest, whatever that means for you, then you're going to be short-tempered, and that's not going to benefit your children. If you're not getting the exercise you need and not taking care of your body, if you're not getting whatever spiritual practices give your life meaning in your life, you're going to feel like you can't be 100% present. We... It's, it is vital that we take care of ourselves before others in order to take care of other people. Self-sacrifice only goes so far in life. And the reason for this is if we're all heart energy, if we're all love, if we're just loving on other people and never thinking of ourselves, eventually we get angry resent and resentful and we're, we become unable to give to other people until we start to take care of ourselves. It's really simple. And the rest of the priorities are pretty simple. The next priority needs to be, if you're living with someone, your most immediate partner. Now, why is that? So I'm gonna ask you a question. If your partner and your children were drowning, who would you pull out of the water first? And please put it in the chat box. I don't even know if I can see the chat box. Oh, there it is, group chat. So if your partner, so assuming you're living with someone and your children are drowning, who do you pull out first? And explain to, just, just let me know. I'm looking to hear from anyone. Rich, I'm not sure if you can see the messages, but I just saw two come in, say children. I see children. Yeah, I'm looking at them now, thank you. Kids and really budgeting, make some love for myself and my children. Okay, thank you. Yes, I couldn't see them. Appreciate the intervention. Now, if you have multiple children drowning and you only have, and you only have so much time, I'm going to argue that you need to save your partner first. And the reason is that with your partner, you can save more children. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a warped metaphor because... In real life, our children aren't drowning, right? In real life, our children are, they, they may be drowning slowly, but in real life, if you have a partner and we're, you're not interacting with your partner, you're not planning with your partner, you're not making sure that your partner's not drowning, then your partner can't be as available for the kids. So I'll tell you a story. This is what really drove this home for me. I am a child of divorce and divorced and remarried. And so when I remarried, my wife and I had two children each from our previous marriages and we thought we were awesome parents and that those other parents were terrible, of course, because that's always what you think when you get out of divorce. That person was so bad. And then we got married and we, we went from having two children with two people to having four children with two people. And all of a sudden we were outnumbered. So in our previous marriages, even though we weren't like thrilled in those marriages, there were a lot of problems with them. That's why they ended. There were problems with those partnerships. And that's why they were, they were dissolved. 
we had two people and two children. We had two partners and two children. So we were able to play what they call in basketball one-on-one -on -one, or in football one-on-one, -on -one, right? We, we, would, we, we each could manage a child. Now, I may not have thought that my wife at the time could manage them very well, but it was better than me managing it, right? Now I go into this new marriage and I have this wife, I'm, you know, we're in love and all that good stuff. And no matter how well both of us did, we were still outnumbered. And so our need for partnership grew exponentially. And we spent a lot of time planning and a lot of time talking about how are we going to have this be a win for everybody? Because we couldn't play one-on-one -on -one anymore. We had to play a zone defense. And so we made a, a lot of traditions, a lot of, or the kids call them rules, but we made a lot of traditions that our children have not forgotten today. So I would argue that if you're really gonna manage a household, you and your partner need to be on the same page and communicating regularly. And that's why I say you pull them out of the ocean first, even though we're not really drowning. And then, of course, your children are come next because with two people, you can really take care of business. With two people, you, you know, in a partnership, you've got two sets of unique skills, two sets of unique abilities, but you share values and principles, like, like rich in relationship and savvy ladies, for example. Like, I am so honored to be on the Savvy Ladies platform because the values of Savvy Ladies resonate so intensely with everything I believe. Because I believe that partnerships are equal. Whether people are married or divorced, there's still some form of partnership going on. And Savvy Ladies is all about empowering women to have greater financial understanding and financial control in their lives, which is vital. It, even though in any partnership, one person might have a greater skill set in one area than another, both people need to understand the ground that they're standing on, even if one person's managing the money. Even if you're divorced and you're paying a financial planner to manage the money for you, you need to understand what they're doing. And Savvy Ladies does an amazing job of uplifting women who are having difficulty with this. And that's in complete harmony with the principles of rich relationship. And not only that, the founder of Savvy Ladies is like a role model for me. So it's, this is a great partnership. And that's, that's why I'm here. All right. So You've got that partnership, you've got the shared values, you plan together, you work together, you're supporting your children, and once you have that, then comes everything else. And everything else is what? It could be the institutions you work with. It could be the religious group that you're affiliated with if you have one. It could be your wider family. It could be your direct neighbors. It could be the schools. Those things come after your children, of course. And what I'm hoping for is that in this time that we're not interacting with these other organizations and groups much, that we really evaluate how we want to interact with them in the future. All right, everybody take a deep breath in, breathe out. We're moving on to the next stage. So we're gonna talk about kids and regularity. And just to hammer this thought home, since everything has changed and we're now at home, we need to take care of ourselves first. That doesn't mean that we say to everyone, get the hell out of the way, I'm taking care of myself. It means that when we're sitting with our partner, to plan out our days here at home. This is where the rubber hits the road, we're at home now. When we're planning out our days with our partner or if we're just at home on our own or with our children, planning out our days, we always need to have our own needs at, to be like planning boulders. So when you're scheduling, there's this concept that when you schedule something, you schedule as a boulder, that means it does not move or if it does move, it can't go very far. So in the course of figuring out how we're going to have a regular schedule, taking care of ourselves needs to always be a part of it. And the need for regularity is huge for us as human beings. We have bodies which have their own rhythms. And those rhythms have been established over years and years of eating and sleeping and resting. And so we need to do our best to honor those rhythms. And our bodies are plugged into a planet that has a regular rhythm, that has seasons, and it goes around the sun in a certain orbit, and there are, just, there are certain rhythms that we can just count on. So having certain rhythms within our household, particularly now when we don't get to go too many other places, is really important. 
So we need to have that sense, that list of what do I need to do today to take care? Is today an exercise today? Do I practice some form of mindfulness every day? Do, is there some kind of reading I need to do to get myself on track? Is, are there people that I need to call? What, do I, what are the things that I need to get into my day to feel like I'm taking care of myself? Not necessarily that that has to be the first thing, but it definitely needs to be a first priority. And the second part is some kind of regular partner time. And I'll give you an example out of my day today. My wife and I actually left the house today and we had a half hour to talk and she works very intensely and I work very intensely. And she said to me, well, you have a half hour of my undivided attention. How can I help you? She said to me. And I thought I laughed a little at the way she said it because I, I, you know, on the one side, it was sort of humorous that I was being scheduled in. But on the other side, I was really honored that the first thing she thought of was how could she help me? How could, what could we talk about that would make things better? And we actually had a very productive conversation. And it's important that some communication about how the day is gonna go, even if it's just touching base to make sure that things are going on schedule or that you're adjusting things as needed is really important when you're living with another human being, particularly when you're living with another human being 24 seven. And then once the two of you are on the same page, the next step is to sit down with your children and schedule in the basics for their well-being. So what do we know about kids? We know that they need to run. We know they need to play. And of course, this is all very age specific. They run and they play in different ways. We know that they need to eat. We know that they need rest. We know that they need a certain amount of socialization, which is a real challenge right now. We know that just like us, they need to be challenged mentally, physically, spiritually. We know all these things about them. So how are we gonna get those pieces into their day and get our work done and honor our partner? And that all takes conversation. But the most important thing is that it happens regularly. So for example, I have a three-year-old grandchild who is, who is cohabitating with us right now. And it is my job to exercise the grandchild and the dogs. And I take it on willingly because I also need to be exercised. And so we know that between three and 3.30, I, the grandchild and the dogs are gonna go out and we're gonna disappear for 45 minutes or an hour. And that's a huge relief to everyone because, and that child knows that. And so she behaves better because that's become a regular part of her schedule. She knows that at some point in the course of her day, she's gonna go out and run her little feet off. And I'm gonna tell you, she runs. Like the second we're out of the house, she runs. And the dogs and I do our best to keep up. But because it's a regular part of our day, she's not bouncing off the walls quite as much if she didn't know that we're coming. That's the kind of regularity that we need to establish with our children under these circumstances. And I wish I could tell you, there's a boilerplate a schedule that I can give you, but really this is a schedule you're gonna need to work out. And if you're living with a partner, it gets more complicated in some ways because one partner is gonna be usually more the detail oriented, they need to do things at certain times in a certain way they don't have a lot of flexibility and the other partner is going to be more strategic and have more flexibility and the strategic partner is usually going to feel like they're being taken advantage of in some way even though they know that the other partner just doesn't have the mindset to to be flexible like that and so managing those feelings while you make those plans and just accepting these are my strengths and their strengths is part of that whole game is this is this making sense to everybody Okay, so we're going to move on. All right, so now we've got, presumably, we've sat down with our partner, or we don't have one, which makes it a little easier in some ways. We sat down with our children, we figured out a regular schedule. And I'm just going to ask, uh, again, if, in the chat box, can you tell me, yes or no, have you seen the movie Groundhog Day? Rich, I'm seeing some yeses. Are there any no's out there? Oh, I do I'm see a no. Outside. There is a no? Mm-hmm, I see a no. Thank God I have you. <laughs> you are my <laughs> new best partner. All right, so for those of you who said yes, be bored for just a moment. But for you who said no, there is this movie that Bill Murray did like in the dark ages of, you know, during the Stone Age called Groundhog Day. And the, the premise of the movie is that Bill Murray gets trapped living the same day over and over and over, right? It's, and it's Groundhog Day. He's stuck in this small town. 
I think it's called Pawtucket or something like that. And every morning he gets up and he sees the same people and, he, and the exact same thing is happening over and over and over. And it, it's, it's driving him crazy. And I'll spare you, I won't spare the, uh, spoil the ending. You might want to see it. But I think a lot of people are having the experience of Groundhog Day right now. Like anyone who's seen this movie that I talked to says, oh yeah, this is definitely Groundhog Day. It's, and it's driving them a little batty. So the, the problem with too much regularity, like we said before, kids need regularity. They like boundaries. So do grownups, by the way. That's why we live in a, a law-bound, litigious society. We like to know that it's safe. Uh, and the problem is that we also like things to be a little different every now and then. And so part of the problem is that we're all doing work in the same place and seeing the same people over and over and over. And it feels like Groundhog Day. So we want to strategize for a spicier life. We want to build some new habits and some new traditions. And traditions, it, uh, these are, this is the reduced definition. There are other definitions. It's the handing down of information, beliefs, and customs by word of mouth or by example from one generation to another. So what's the example that we're setting for our children right now as we are in lockdown? I'm not sure, I'm not in your household, but think about it. What is the example? What values are we teaching our children in the way we've been handling the last four to six weeks? And how much cultural continuity in social attitudes and customs has there been in your household? And how might you take tradition, which is kind of a stodgy, heavy word, and like take it and turn it into something spicy? And so I submit to you that there's a huge opportunity when we can start creating our own traditions because tradition is the way that we communicate values to, to our children. Tradition is the way that we teach our children how to communicate, how to do things, depending on the tradition. And in the past, our traditions were, oh my God, it's, it's almost Halloween and there's Christmas decorations coming out. I gotta do something about Christmas while I decorate for Halloween. Like a lot of our traditions are being driven by the media had been driven by the media up to now. Right now, the media is kind of dead. Like all that we're seeing out there is COVID-19, COVID-19, COVID-19. And now there's stuff by a lot of coaches and companies about how do you manage yourself in COVID-19? But it's, you know, most of us aren't paying attention or we're desperately looking for something. What if we started controlling the messaging in our own household? What if we did it and we started to break up our days a little? And so an example from... My own household is one of my more, cre I wish I could tell you that I invented this, but one of my more creative children said, listen, I cannot do this anymore. We have to separate Monday from Friday. And so we sat down and she and my children, the children are so much better at this than we are. They spun off an activity for every day of the week that would make that day unique. So we already had some activities, like we, on Saturday, Sundays, excuse me, we have Sunday brunch which uh, could be bacon and eggs and pancakes, or it could be lox and bagels and cream cheese. Uh, and because we're a multi, uh, multicultural household, and so you know, we're, we honor everyone's restrictions. And what we all knew is that when, like when Sunday came, we were gonna smell food cooking, and at 10 o'clock, we sit our butts down and we eat for the most part. Every now and then, people had things to do and bounced out, but it, it was a, it's a tradition. So we always know when Sunday is, but they made up things for other days of the week. And so what I wanna show you is how to do that. And what, by the way, what's so good about eating together is that when you eat together, you speak to one another. And when you speak to one another, you communicate values, you communicate principles, in fact, there are studies that show that if a family sits down and eats together once a week, those children are less likely to uh, go out and experiment with alcohol and other substances at early ages, once a week. So there's something about just having that communication that keeps it safer and more connected. And so if you can do that more often, how cool. I'm still not master of the slide change. Next slide. All right, so the areas that we wanna focus on as we design our new traditions are the areas that I asked you to look at earlier, which are self, partnership, children, work, career. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you very quickly, um, can you go back please to the 10 things that you rated? And uh, could you throw out the one that was the worst or second worst in the chat box? And Maggie's probably gonna help me. <laughs> yes, I'll help you. Because she's so helpful. <laughs> Uh, 
I'll, uh, okay, I'm seeing fun and enjoyment. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Couple more, fun and enjoyment. What else do we have? I'm seeing personal development. Personal and development. Also seeing fun activities. Yeah, I see that too. All right. So a lot of it's fun, and what a big surprise, right? Because we're having Groundhog Day, and how much fun is that? Um, yeah, Bill, Bill worked out some really destructive ways to have fun in that. We don't want to go there. Take one of those areas, and you want to start strategizing an activity that's going to help you with, well, just strategizing spicier activities is going to deal with fun and enjoyment, I promise you. In terms of personal development, that's not really... A family, well, you might be able to turn it into a family activity. Let's go to the next slide and talk about it. But think about those things. Think about what you want to develop and grow as you design your home traditions. So let's talk about tactics. We want to start with your dreams or, you know, areas that you want to improve. And maybe you have a bucket list. Maybe you don't. It might be a good thing to make one. You could start with, this is going to be a good one. When you can go on vacation, what are three places you'd like to go? And you don't need to write this down now, or you can. But a game you could play, actually, I'm seriously thinking about doing this in my own household because we don't do this yet, is to have everybody write down where they'd like to go on vacation. And then one night a week, we're going to like order food from a restaurant that has that food. And everyone is going to do their best to get familiar with that culture and talk about at dinner while we're eating sushi, you know, where we want to go in Japan or while we're eating spaghetti, where we want to go in Italy. I think Italy may be a hard place to visit unless you actually have had the virus. That's another consideration. But the point is to start dreaming. The point is to start uh, moving out of your household through imagination and through play, right? This is basically play. And if you make it a tradition to do this once a week, you can honor everybody's vacation. Uh, we've got maybe... I hope four weeks, maybe eight weeks of this left. So you only need four to eight places to go to play this game. And I promise you that it's going to be fun. And if you let the kids drive it, it's going to be even better. Another one would be movies you wish you had seen or want to see again. And of course, this can go either way. You, can, you could live the movie. You could watch the movie. You can have movie night, however you want to do it. Another one would be, oh, it's getting very late. I'm going to move through this fast. What creative crafty things do you like to do or wish you had tried? What languages? That's a stretch. And last of all, what heroes or role models? I, one. I, I want to use this one also where we each pick a role model and maybe we dress up like them and we play uh, that game where you have to guess who, they, you know, guess who the other person is. And then the per we can each tell why we like that role model. And what I like about that is that when we say what we like about a role model, we're communicating values, and our kids are communicating their values to us, which is so cool. More tactics. You can uh, play with activities. You know, what are your favorite games? We tried game night. We're a little overly competitive here. Game night's not always a good idea, but we did actually have a good time with it, though I was abused for winning by someone who will not be named for several days afterwards. Um, maybe you can... Learn the Macarena together, which is pretty goofy, or other dances, or maybe you can have a dance party. Maybe you can have tea time. Actually, we do this now. Uh, every week we have tea time on Thursdays, and we video chat with our other children at tea time and play with accents and have a good time with it. What recipes can you learn? What can you cook as a family? This is a challenge for us. We mostly bake together. Um, another good trick is... Family cocktail night, though obviously my grandchild doesn't participate. My children have alcohol-free drinks, and we invite our, our, uh, the next generation, my parents and my wife's parents, to play with us. Okay, so let's see how I did with my promise here. We will learn about what resilience is and how to incorporate resilience in our new daily lives. How did we do with that? You can text yes or no. Begin to reprioritize. Uh, same thing. How do we do with that? Get clarity on how to regularize our children in our daily lives so that they work. And four, strategize ways to spice up our weeks as we build new traditions. So, okay. So it looks like we hit the promises. But if you feel like that I didn't, um, you, you are welcome to talk to me after this. And we can explore what, you know, what I missed and how I might help you. 
So we're going to skip this exercise because we're crap out of time, but I'm going to just fly through it. I just take some time to think about how you use your, your hours for self-care, partner time, socializing, children and family and career, and think about how you might redistribute those hours. That's a tool you can use. And now we're going to get to your gift. Your gift is if, you, if you're in a relationship and have a partner, I have a playful partners group. It's new on Facebook. Reach out to me at Rich in Relationship on Facebook to join, and we're going to start putting in content in there. Um, it's going to be sort of like a, a pressure cooker for ideas on how we can build more structure in our families and games that we can play. And the better gift, though, is that I'm going to give you 45 minutes to speak together and brainstorm ways that we can spice up your family, no obligation. And the win for me in this is that, again, I really love it when I can help people uplift their children and build resilience in their families. And this idea of family resilience on this level is one that I'm just playing with. So you're actually helping me by scheduling that call. And you can schedule it by going to bit.ly forward slash P partners, which is play, I, P, playful partners would be awful long, P partners. And the idea is that we want to develop partnerships that are playful, not stodgy and stuck. We want to move from having kind of a parallel life experience in our own home where we're feeling frustrated and aren't communicating to playing together and playing with our children and having some fun again. Uh, we want to develop ourselves personally and we want to support our partner in developing their, themselves personally while growing together as partners. So that's an awful lot. Sorry, I thought that was going to be 30 minutes. Yeah, I think if Maggie's okay with it, are, do we do Q&A now, Maggie? Are we good with that? Uh, yes. Um, and Rich, I hope you saw all the yeses in the chat there I do. about you okay, delivering on the promises. I just wanted to make sure you saw that. Good. And I, I also saw a message, um, thanks for all the great ideas. I'm going to start using them with my family. So awesome. Awesome. But I mean, the best, the best source for the ideas is your family. So it's like, uh, like in a business, for example, if you bring in a new management idea and, and get, sell it, try and sell it to the employees, the employees are like, WTF, we're doing great. But if you go to the employees and say, hey, we need to spice things up and you know, what, like, how, how might we do this? Like, and, and ask them, you know, what's, uh, if we were going on vacation, where would you want to go? Hey, let's do a dinner thing out of it. Like, you want, you really want to enroll and engage them. It's, it's, it's a bottom up experience rather than a top down experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Okay. So if anyone has a question now, they can email info at savvyladies.org or they can also use the chat box. And I know we had uh, some questions come in. So the first one for you, Rich, is asking, how do I get over the guilt I feel when I put myself first? Mm. How you get over the, that is a process. Um, like intellectually, I can frame it this way. It goes back to if you always put them first and yourself second, eventually you're going to do a terrible job putting like because you won't show you if you're not a hundred percent. If you're not feeling a hundred percent, you can't give a hundred percent. That's the that's the easiest way to short circuit that. Uh, and the. So what and what I do to manage that because I'm kind of a heart person too is like I I really want to show up for other people first and and my winning can be secondary at times. Um, what I do with that is I make sure that when I put myself first, I do it at a time that isn't taking away from my family. So I'm the guy who will get up at five o'clock in the morning to do my spiritual practices because I know nobody else is awake then and I can't possibly be showing up for them then. So that is a way that I do that. Now, I'm not saying that's the best way. The best way would be to get that, for us all to get that we are totally worth it and that we deserve to put ourselves first. But that's a process. So the, the short-term solution is to put yourself first at times when they couldn't possibly need you. Uh, and and what I, my personal experience was that when I had difficulty doing that, I really had to look at, all right, so it's not guilt. For some reason, I just don't think I deserve this. And I had to really get clear 
that I did deserve it and that I wanted that time. And so the first step is to put yourself first when nobody could possibly need you. And, but you, ultimately, you got to find out, why am I feeling guilty? You know, why, like what, uh, that's, that goes back to the iceberg, right? 80% of the iceberg is underwater. You know, somewhere in our, our childhoods, whoever you are, you and I, we learned that it's really important to sacrifice for our families. That's an important value for us. And we didn't learn the other part that you can't sacrifice if you got nothing to give. And so it, that's about rewiring the iceberg and that takes coaching or therapy. And so a lot of the work that I do with people is helping them rewire that stuff. Uh, it's not therapy, it's, though I'm, I'm, I am trained as a therapist, it's more helping them find a way to rewire that sacrifice for others things so that it works for them. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the next question is saying, you, you talked about priorities, and I know that my partner has different priorities than, than I do. How would I get him on board so that we come to work together? Does it start with a yeah, conversation? That, that is a great question. Um, I had a client this, this week who, actually last week, who started that question. Um, there were things that her partner just wasn't willing to do. And what worked for her was to, get, to go back to what is the central shared purpose of their partnership. So, so she had a conversation with her, in this case, it was a woman, sometimes it's a man. She had a central a conversation with her husband at a moment that felt right and didn't feel, it's important that the other person doesn't feel criticized, where they, she said, hey, you know what, we're locked up here together and I just wanna make sure we're on the same page. Like, let's get really clear, let's talk about what's our core purposes as a couple. Like, where are we going with this? What's our long-term plan? What do we want for our children? What do we want for ourselves? And then she worked her way back from that, but she, she didn't do it all in one conversation, by the way. She had that conversation first, and then the, a couple of days later, she said, all right, now that we're on the same page about that, let's talk about how, how do we take that central purpose and make it happen in our day-to-day -day lives? Because to have it all at once is a lot. But once you sort of have a very detailed conversation about where are we going? Like, what, I know we fell in love and we're mar you know, we got married together and we had these kids together. Where is it that we're taking these kids? And, and it's about moving out of that survival mindset into uh, a, thri a thrival, a friend of mine calls it mindset, where you're gonna thrive more because you're, you have your eyes on the prize together jointly. And once you have a shared goal, then you can start to talk about what each of your roles are in making that goal happen and how does that goal manifest in your day-to-day -day experience. But it's, and, if the other person is unwilling to talk about it, then at all, um, that might be an outside help situation. But I, I would start with, you know, th with primary purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, all right, it looks like we have two more questions for you. So the next one is asking, how do you bring calmness to an elderly, elderly parent, parent who keeps saying, "I'm okay." Yeah. Not stressed mm -hmm. about this pandemic and so forth, but the other parent and adult children know this particular parent is stressed. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to guess stressed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know that the, I'm thinking this through. Sorry for the, the pause there. Um, so we know that the elderly are experiencing stress, the elderly being 65, 70 and older, the people who are more vulnerable are experiencing some level of fear and stress because uh, their, chance, their possibilities of dying are significantly higher than people younger. And talking about the event is not going, talking about COVID-19 is not going to help. So really, what are the things, I, I would say think about this person as you would one of your children, not that they are a child or childlike, but ultimately, um, it, it, they, the feelings they're having are coming from that same place. Like when we're feeling fearful that there's, it's like a childlike place within us. Uh, and so I, was, I would think about what calms that person under normal circumstances? What are the th activities that help calm that person? And I'm like battling with this. So I'd start with like sort of daily calming things, whatever they are. Um, maybe that person has some practices from earlier in their life that they can bring back 
uh, ultimately, managing fear is about mindfulness, meditation, or prayer. I mean, ultimately, when a person is stressed, it's because their amygdala, which is the survival mind, is saying, look out for that tiger. In this case, the COVID-19 is the tiger. Wow, I can't see the tiger, but I know it's there. So it's about moving them from that survival mind to their cerebral cortex. And so the second that they recognize that, that, that what's going on, they start to move out of that. So if they're, if they're denying their, that they are stressed, they're probably protecting their family. They probably don't wanna be a burden and that sort of thing. Um, so I would start with what calms them normally. And then I would probably do it this way. <laughs> my brain, this is what my brain popped up. I would ask them, how are, how are people that they know that, that are their age or older, um, how are they managing their fear about the virus? And I'd have a conversation about that. And I would talk about other elder, elderly people in the third person. I think that's, that's probably, I see, yes, we've been trying to pray with elderly parents to bring calmness, but sometimes get back to the same thinking. Yeah, so the pray, the, the actually praying moves, is moving your elderly parent to another, another space in her brain. And you know what? The amygdala doesn't shut off automatically, but the more that there's, the, the, the more regularly we practice prayer, meditation, or mindfulness, the, actually our amygdala actually shrinks. So the more that you do that, the less it's gonna come up. And like I said, I'd have a conversation with them about what do you, how do they think other seniors are managing this? And um, how, you know, how are other seniors protecting themselves? And as long as you're obey, obeying the quarantine suggestions, um, your senior's probably very safe, but it, it's gonna be a process. You, like, you, it's not like a, fear is not like a switch. You can't just shut it off and hope that it stays off. You, it, it, it's our amygdala, that part of our brain, it's always looking for danger. So it's gonna, you, you, every time your, your senior prays, the switch goes off and then they, the amygdala kicks in and starts talking to them and it flips back on. And it might be a situation of just praying more often. Um, it might be, if, if, if they're praying, they probably have faith in their life. So if they have a faith-based life, then focus on the faith because Faith and fear do not occupy, and I don't mean, by the way, for those of you who are not religiously connected, faith is a, is a word that applies in the secular world also. Faith is the belief in a better future of some kind. So focus on that faith. Focus on creating that future. Like that, the, the travel dinner idea is a faith-based practice. One day this is gonna be over and we are gonna travel somewhere, and so we're gonna learn about these places now. That's, that's part of what makes that uplifting is its belief in a new future, which is inevitable. I'm sorry, that was a very long answer. I apologize. No, and I, I don't know if you saw it earlier. Thanks for taking the time to answer this. So I'm sure that was very helpful. Thanks. I don't, for you know, feel free to schedule a call with me if you want to talk about it more. Like if you, if you want to keep talking about this and you want to dig deeper, we'll spend 45 minutes together and you will come out of it with next steps. And, I, uh, you know, again, it, like it's going to be next steps that are appropriate to your situation. No hook. There's no bait here. This is a clean offer. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Do you have time for one more question? I have all the time in the world, as long as you do, Maggie. Okay, great. So the next one is saying, I'm working from home, and I'm wanting to make the most of this time while my kids are home from school. I feel like I need to give everything I can to them now while I can, or else I'll regret it. Is there a way to do that and also make sure that I'm still taking care of myself? Could you repeat that, please? I, I, what I heard was, uh, actually, tell me if I got it right. They're working at home, and they have their children at home, and the conflict is how to do both and take care of themselves? Yeah, wanting to give everything they can to their kids while everyone's home, but making sure they're still taking care of themselves, if you have tips for that. Yeah, so even children need alone time. So there's, a, there's this psychological theory we all babble about in the world called introverts and extroverts, right? So introverts are people who need to recharge their battery by being alone. And extroverts are people who theoretically recharge their battery by being with other people. But even extroverts need a certain amount of alone time. Like uh, I'll go back to Bill Clinton, who was like the most extroverted person I can ever think of. This is a guy who thrived. The reason why he got by in four hours of sleep is he just didn't care about sleep. 
he thrived on being with other people and being connected to other people. I mean, you know, politics aside and his personal choices aside, because he's a human being who made mistakes, you know, this is, uh, we're just talking about people who are like this. He, he needed to be with people. And I actually was in a room with this guy once uh, by accident. Uh, my father took me to the opera. My father-in-law took me to the opera and Bill Clinton showed up and you could feel it when the, you can feel it when this guy enters the room. Like it was like amazing. He's, there's just something about him. He needs to be, that's a true extrovert. Your children probably are not Bill Clinton. They need some alone time. And so it's about figuring out what does alone time mean for them. The, the, our children need a certain amount of time to think about things. They need a certain amount of time of things to process things emotionally, and they all have ways that they do it. And uh, the other side of that is to get, uh, you know, if, if you're like me, and you want to be there for your family, and you don't want to take a chance that you're not going to be there, you make that time for yourself when you know that they're preoccupied, sleeping or busy with something else. Um, a way you could do that is screen time. I'm not a huge fan of screen time. Everyone's trying to restrict their screen time really unsuccessfully. So here's a tool my sister created for managing screen time. She's got a book about it. Um, she, she advocates to use screen time like a book report. So she says, when you set your kids up in front of that screen to watch a movie, cartoon, I'm not talking about games, but you know, where they're actually watching something and it isn't necessarily educational, ask them in that hour or 45 minutes or half hour, or two hours or whatever you're setting them up for, tell them at the end of this, I want to report on who was in the story, right? What was the setting that was there? Uh, what was the time period and what was going on in the story? What was the conflict that was in the story and how did they resolve it? These are the five qualities of storytelling. So you set them up and maybe you write it out for them and say, tonight at dinner, I'm gonna wanna, I just wanna have it like for fun. I just wanna know who was in it, where was it happening? What was the time period? What was the conflict? And how is it resolved? And by doing that, you'll start using screen time to teach them basic reading comprehension. Basic reading comprehension is picking out those five things from a story. And so you won't feel so bad about parking them in front of the screen. And they'll actually start thinking while they're watching. So instead of just kind of zombieing out, they're going to be thinking, oh, my God, I got to tell dad, you know, the five things. So... That's a tool that you can use where you're going to, that's a tool that we use where we feel less guilty about them having that screen time. Okay. That's a great tip. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, um, all right. So those look like all the questions we have. So I want to thank everyone for, for joining us today and, and asking a lot of questions. And I want to thank you so much, Rich. And we will be sending out this, um, this information here. I just want to say, do not miss this opportunity. Like this thing of being trapped with your family, this is the opportunity to unplug from the wider society. And I promise you that in like four weeks or six weeks, we are going to be bombarded by the media because they want to get us back to buying things when they say to buy it and buying what they say. Like it sounds a little conspiracy theory, but it isn't because that's what marketing is all about. Marketing is all about getting people to spend their money where the marketer wants them to spend it. And this is the opportunity to teach your children about this, to insulate them, to build traditions where you don't have to be reactive anymore. You can be proactive where you can turn off things that you don't want them to see, or you can not be involved with people who are trying to sell things to you or your family that you don't want them to sell. Like in six weeks, it's going to be insane. You know, the, 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 the stock market likes a predictable economy, and a predictable economy is what we had. Do we really want to go back to what we had? Has this really been so bad? So think about that as you do this. And with that, I'm complete. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rich. We'll uh, we'll send this out to everyone, and yes, we encourage everyone to take advantage take advantage of this time and stay healthy. And we'll, we'll follow up over email. Thanks for joining us, and thanks again so much, Rich. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.